Exordium. It means start in Latin. Who's a one-hit wonder? It is not an endearing term, but it is usually accurate. Maybe the names Zager and Evans or the title 2525 come to mind. The 1960s folk rock duo, if you want to call them that, who shook the music world with In the Year 2525. The dystopian ballad was number one on the charts when man walked on the moon on July 24th, 1969. In contrast to the buoyant jubilation of that summer, exemplified in Woodstock, Zager and Evans' cynical hit warned of a doomed future where humanity is used up. For that brief moment, Zager and Evans were hailed as the American answer to the Beatles. They were not. This is what doomed them once 1970 hit. The Nebraskan duo are one-hit wonders for a reason. They in no way deserve the score and many give them in retrospect. 2525 has often been called the worst song to ever reach number one on the charts, but that's far from the truth. It's not great musically, but it is charming, especially when you know its background. Evans wrote it, and Zager composed the music. Beyond the strange lyrics of their hit, the two's music toyed with rock, folk, and psychedelic music. They almost made it to Woodstock too, almost literally in their case. Somehow, after In the Year 2525, their music became even more out there. Probably too out there for the public. A bad habit that eventually sunk their second chance. So who, and why were, the most iconic one-hit wonders ever? The story of Zager and Evans begins in, of all states, Nebraska. Denny Zager and Rick Evans were culturally farm boys, though maybe not literally. Rick Evans was born in Lincoln, Nebraska in 1943, and Denny Zager was born in 1944 in Wymore, Nebraska. Lincoln, though, would become the two's stomping ground and place of origin. They met in Lincoln at Nebraskan Waisland University in 1962. Both being from Nebraska, both shared similar backgrounds by default, because it was Nebraska in 1960. The duo would become the musical pride of the state. Though Denny Zager and Rick Evans did not begin as Zager and Evans. Fueled by the rise of rock and roll, Zager formed the quintet The Eccentrics in 1961, a pop rock group dedicated to playing contemporary hits around the state. For the time, the group was popular in Nebraska and had gigs playing parties and proms. The quintet was writing off the popularity of the Beatles at the time, as is obvious, but the Eccentrics had a respectable reputation on their own. In 1965, the five even changed their hairstyles to pseudo-pompadours to match the name The Eccentrics. By 65, though, the group was drifting apart stylistically, and drummer Danny Schindler left for a stint in Vietnam, as was the time. The group dissolved when guitarist Danny Zager left to create a new group called The Devils. I think that's how you pronounce it, it's Devils with two L's. Though they would be short-lived in comparison to both The Eccentrics and later Zager and Evans. In 1967-1968, though, Zager and Evans' musical paths would cross again. While bouncing around clubs and gigs in Lincoln, both became interested in folk music and ballads. Since the two worked so well together in The Eccentrics, with their similar personalities, they decided to reform as a duo for their performances, taking the incredibly creative name Zager and Evans. Since 1964, Evans had accumulated a massive backlog of songs he had written, a majority of which would wind up on Zager and Evans, the two's first album, and their lone hit was among this material. In the year 2525 had been written, supposedly, in 1964, but would not be performed until 1967-1968. According to Zager, Rick Evans had written the song in 10 minutes in the back of a Volkswagen van after a party where he had taken some then-illegal substances. The major influence for 2525, though, was Adolphus Huxley's novel, Brave New World, which Evans had been engrossed at the time. Evans himself was a dedicated reader of science fiction and more literature. This original version, though, was a lot more folk music based. While Evans had tried it with several bands, he could never get the song or the sound to work. With Evans' lyrics, though, Zager rewrote the tune in 1967 to a more rock-based style, fixing Evans' conundrum. Lyrically, the song retained the group's folk music origins, though its ballad form was the major part. The first night the two performed it live, the audience was so entranced they demanded several encores. Wherever the two performed it, the song was a hit. It soon became a fan favorite throughout Lincoln, then Nebraska, then even the tri-state area. 
After the two played the song at the nightclub Clayton House, they got so many requests to play the song afterwards, they decided it had to be recorded. In the late 1960s though, recording the song was no small order. The still nationally unknown duo had nowhere near enough money to finance the effort. Instead, apparently, a Lincoln bar owner, likely from either the Clayton House or Catman's Lounge, decided to pay for the effort after the two performed it at his establishment. Enlisting the former The Eccentrics bassist, Mark Dalton, and drummer Dave Trupp, Dalton recalled the barman saying, Look boys, I'm going to give you the money to go record that song because everybody loves it, and I think it's going to be a hit. Then handed over, or loaned, depending on whose story you believe, the group $500 to finance the trip and studio time to record it. In 1968 then, they traveled down to a studio in Odessa, Texas to record 2525. Mark Dalton recalled the studio being an unappealing, square stone building that sat flat in an empty, dusty field. It worked though. The music slash tempo was recorded in only about an hour, after weeks of practice, but the vocal harmonies took multiple attempts which lasted the rest of the day. Lacking background, the studio brought in the local high school orchestra and members from the Odessa Symphony to help back up the song. After that, the original version of the song was pressed for 500 to 1,000 copies, the exact number is unclear, by Truth Records, Zager and Evans' own label, and was produced in Nashville. The B-side for it was the subpar song by Rick Evans called Little Kids. Uh, awkward name aside, it's a pretty unremarkable track. Upon returning to Lincoln, the duo sold the copies of the song out of the trunk of their car. It was a local hit. It became a favorite on Nebraskan radio stations which spread it statewide. Word of mouth was more than enough. Soon record labels in New York and California were hearing about the Sager and Evans duo from Nebraska. Soon after, the duo were receiving contracts trying to capitalize on their rising success. All these fell into the hands of the pair's lawyer, Paul Galter, a literal farm lawyer who had no idea how to respond to any of them. Galter was overwhelmed until RCA Records' Jerry Weintraub, manager of John Denver, flew out to Nebraska to meet them. Weintraub hired the group with a contract for 90,000 guaranteed against advanced royalties, more than 600,000 due to inflation today. Then flew them out to record in Chicago. Unfortunately, this left Dalton and Trupp out in the cold, their contributions ignored. RCA only signed Zager and Evans, and Zager and Evans only got the short-lived spotlight. For their first album, 2525, Exordium and Terminus, the song was upgraded for national release. RCA staff producer Ethel Gabriel and arranger Bobby Christian remixed the strings and bass, added the backing mariachi slash horn sounds, and upped the prominence of the vocals on the master. This buried the song's folk roots while it retained the ballad form. For years optimistic as 1969, in the year 2525 struck a strangely dark chord, guitar or not. Both versions were hits, both locally and nationally. From July 12, 1969, it sat on the top of the Billboard Hot 100s for six weeks, also peaking at number one on the UK singles from August to September for three weeks. A nearly impossible feat for a song that predicts the destruction of man by the year 10,000, as the human race grows more dependent and decadent on technology which consumes them. The song representative of the last gasp of psychedelic rock as the 1960s faded out, really. Not everyone was a fan, apparently. Rick Evans' father hated it. Actual sources on this claim are scarce, but apparently Mr. Evans was not at all a fan of his son's musical career. According to a claim on Reddit, trustworthy I know, while principal in Lyons, Colorado, Mr. Evans refused to listen to the song, turning off the radio whenever it came on. As the account making the claim is deleted, it is impossible to say if there's any truth to this, but it shows how dominant the song was in culture for its six-week reign at the top of the charts. With a once-in-a-lifetime super hit under their belts, Zager and Evans, though more Evans, set out to follow up the song with their first album, 2525 Exordium and Terminus. It was a mixed bag. When the two were on, they were on. When they were off, their songs sounded like the worst hippie schlock. From the album, songs like Fred and Taxi Man Shine, Fred being a musically solid indictment of the Vietnam War and warfare in general, all the makings of a second folksy hit, if not for the lyrical content about a murderous psychopath named Fred, who gets set to fight in Vietnam where he's hailed as a national hero. Tell me Fred, what are we gonna tell our friends? Taxi Man is a boisterous, brass-heavy tale of political apathy and social divisions. It's 60s protest fare, as is obvious, but it's more than the sum of its parts. 
Other songs like Bayonne is a vaguely Creole sounding song with slightly absurd lyrical content. In the Land of the Green is the duo at their worst, Hippy Dippy Filler Schmaltz. For the two, it was a soft, but not awful, start. Most of the material was from Evan's backlog written years ago. The problem was the pair was still divided between their folk witty lyric space and an attempt to be a more appealing pop rock band. Jack of a few trades is obviously the master of none. This still could not explain the duo's next official outing, which was equal parts idiotic and incredibly ballsy. To promote their next album in 1970, Zager and Evans, the eponymous pair, decided to follow up their first single with the insane song Mr. Turnkey, both literally and figuratively. A bizarre pop folk psychedelic affair that tells the tale of a miserable Wichita Falls rapist who crucifies himself in his cell? Or nails himself by the left wrist to the door? Or maybe the wall? It's unclear. Most of the logic in and about the song is unclear. Here's a general summary of it. The criminal, in prison, bemoans, I don't want to be the man I am, after his assault on a woman who he describes as being lovelier than oil rights, promising the jailer, or Mr. Turnkey here, you've never seen anything like this before. Before his death, the repentant asks Mr. Turnkey to tell her I'm sorry, after which he nails himself to the wall or crucifies himself, or something, he pierces his body with a nail at least. The most bizarre thing is, the song is... Good? Uh, on a technical level, that is. Almost Steely Dan-esque in form, but not really sound. Mr. Turnkey, she looked at me with flirting eyes. Mr. Turnkey, she was lovelier than oil rice. It is what Zager and Evans should have sounded like most of the time. A unique, folksy, psychedelic mishmash, sharp if deranged lyrical content and wordplay, and a sort of ballad form slash story. Enhanced by the fact the song takes place on August 16th, 1969, the second day of Woodstock, which Zager and Evans were supposedly supposed to attend. The obvious problem was the song was poisonous to radio stations and listeners, as the subject matter makes clear. Though it somehow got some airplay in New York, god knows how. Also, it just barely charted in Australia too. A bubblier radio version failed to gain traction in the United States. As the Mr. Turnkey debacle shows, Zager and Evans, the 1970 album, was a lot more experimental, but all the same problems were there. During R.E.M., or during R.E.M., and The Plastic Park, play with much deeper psychedelia abstraction, and even synths, but During R.E.M. is not much of anything for a song, and The Plastic Park is a textureless, schmaltzy anti-war song that lacks the bite of Taxi Man or Fred. <laughs> Mr. Turnkey and Crutches are the high watermarks for the album. Crutches itself is a funky, swinging tune with more Rick Evans social observations. How everyone covers for their own failures, we all have Crutches. crutches. It's a sharp song with a catchy chorus, but it's just not a hit. Reginald Ludwig is definitely Zager and Evans, but trying to explain how is pretty tough. It's a song about a notorious tax cheat and his lovely wife, whose gains from his schemes are increasingly more bizarre and described in odd ways. Things like how he purchases a seven-bedroom goldfish bowl. That is until the IRS gets a tip about his out-there lifestyle. Congratulations, Reginald Ludwig! Probably the pair's most tongue-in-cheek song. The issue is, Zager and Evans, both album and band, failed to deliver another hit. By 1971, the two were old hat, had failed to follow up on their mega hit, and RCA decided to drop the two's contract because of it. It was apparent by now Zager and Evans were not going to rival the Beatles, but they still had their own quirky allure. The duo had begun to bounce around several labels, only able to secure deals off a of fading one-hit wonder reputation. That is until Vanguard Records signed them to another album in 1971. 1971's Food for the Mind would be the two's most cohesive, but final album. It still suffers from the hippy-dippy, sugary schmultz sound that plagues the rest of their output, 
but the album is Zagert Evans' best outing. None of the songs are outstanding, but none are really bad either. For their final attempt, Zagert Evans returned to the concept of 2525 for the album's new single, Hydra 15,000, a classic, filky, sci-fi song and ode to DNA. Another futuristic ballad, it tells the story of how humanity, through DNA modification, sought to become Project Hydrate 15,000, a truly peaceful creature that genetically cannot wage war or conquer one another. In hopes of world peace, humanity sacrifices itself to become the promised Hydra 15,000. Yeah, this one is a really 60s song. It's one of Zagar and Evan's best too, with a soulful sound and sincere, almost naive lyrics. The rest of the album highlights follow this so long to the 60s musical attitude. Hydra 15,000, you will never know that mankind sacrificed itself so you could live and grow. While most of Food for the Mind is hippy dippy schmaltz, it's catchy, endearing schmaltz. Food for the Mind, the title track, is very 1960s, but it's a good foot tapper. It comes in all kinds. Protein is love that you need to survive. Vitamin C, a smile for me. Believe in the Man with a Dream is another humorous observation on humanity's innovations throughout history. It opens by praising the first caveman who learned to kill another caveman by hitting him over the head with a jawbone because he had a dream. Hit him one time in the head with a jawbone and knocked him dead and then he said, nah, 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 believe in the man with the dream. I Am is a 60s peace and love song, but it's good enough to rest just above the insufferable threshold. Brother, Can You Spare a Dime is a pretty interesting one. It's a modernized version of the Depression-era folk tune, hearkening back to the duo's own origins. While not a Zager and Evans original, it has enough producer shine and cinema sound to be good, being purposefully archaic in style. The House on Sumner Street is a personal favorite of the hippy-dippy sentimental schmaltz Zager and Evans put out. It's a pretty soulful song, telling about a man walking through the house where he had his first love. He says he will remember the moments in the house, but the place is soon to be demolished to build a freeway. He stands alone in the house, now dilapidated, on its last day, saying the warmth of his first love still clings here, like summer clings to fall. He leaves saying he'll always love that house on Sumner Street, no matter if the one-way runs kinda south. So here I am. Then there's Alice Browning. Alice Browning lived with Floyd in the trailer court number four. She works in the laundry. Said she couldn't own an ugly giant toad. What am I supposed to do with this? It seems that Yurn Evans had much the same questions by 1971. Their appeal had sizzled out. The two had been asked to play the American Bandstand at Woodstock in 69. The appearance never materialized as Evans was hit by a drunk driver when leaving the Royal Grove on their way to Philadelphia. It is impossible to say how much Woodstock would have changed their career trajectory but it could have not hurt. The two were also at the peak of their popularity then, and their schmaltz would have gone a long way with the crowd. It was a turning point that could have been. At worst, they would have been immortalized in that moment, meaning they would have become known as little more than Woodstock filler, but by 1971, even that opportunity was two years long past due. Really, with no more hits, the pair failed to adapt. By 1970, Zager was confident they were doomed to be one-hit wonders. As he explained decades later, we couldn't follow the song. That was why we were your classic one-hit wonders. Nor would the two's softer sound work in the harder, faster 70s. Their later albums show they tried to be experimental, and they were, but never remarkable beyond 2525. Part of the problem was an inability, or impossibility, to give up the folk roots of Rick Evans' songwriting. All their albums suffer from some degrees of sonic whiplash and split identity, maybe appropriate for a musical duo whose songs have a strong sense of fatalism. 
Either way, the two drifted into 1972 with no plans and really no projects. The end was very obvious by 1974 when the breakup occurred. They continued on for some time touring with several local hits in Nebraska, but Zager was falling out of love with the music. While the two remained friends, a falling out over royalties killed their partnership on the business end. For decades afterwards, promoters were clamoring for reunions and even offered another album at some point, but neither was ever interested in a return. And with Rick Evans' terminus in 2018, a Zager and Evans reunion can never be. The two went their separate ways for the rest of their life. Not that Rick Evans ever needed a reunion. Due to royalties, the man literally never had to work another day in his entire life. By all accounts, he never did. As he said, I couldn't sell shit to a dung beetle. Rick did continue playing music for some time after the breakup. He rambled about Nebraska and Nashville and the country for at least a decade afterwards. Claims state his final gig was around Lake Tahoe on New Year's Eve 1984. After midnight, he decided to pack in his music career for the rest of his life. He no longer had the energy for it and did not need the money. Afterwards, Evans is kind of hard to track. He entered a purposeful obscurity. Often, he would vanish from people's lives for years and then randomly reappear in them for no reason. His name too would often pop up in sailing and model ship magazines, both hobbies for which he had developed a taste for during his long retirement. A very free soul, Evans apparently once got lost in a grocery store for an hour because he was absorbed in thought about Dave Marsh's book, Louie Louie. Beyond that, he lived his very unique, quiet life. He died at home in Santa Fe in 2018 from natural causes. While Denny Zager fell out of love with music itself, he still loved guitars, which he still does to this day. From 1971 and on, Zager had developed an interest in building and modifying guitars. He stayed in Lincoln to teach music and guitar, developing the now famous Zager Guitars and Method, known as Zager Easy Play, which teaches guitar based on ear and not sheet music. Zager himself developed it to teach guitar to his own son, who also now works with him in his guitar shop. The method spread beyond Nebraska by 2000. It seeks to take away pain from the fingers while playing, allowing more speed and accuracy for longer playtimes. a method for which Zager is now famous once again. Frequently, he makes trips to California to develop guitars for musicians and celebrities. A life after music, still in music. That's the exordium and terminus of Zager and Evans' career. Their lone hit 2525 may be annoying to some, but it's far from the worst song ever. Like all their music and their career, it has its own charm. One which even John Denver admired, as Denny Zager once claimed, before John Denver was discovered, he used to write to me all the time asking how we knew about test tube babies and things that hadn't even been discovered yet. Rick used to tell him he had been abducted by aliens and saw into the future. Every few years, or decade, the song turns back up again for another round of popular appeal, a sort of sincere dystopia about the imagined failures of the future. Hardly could the two imagine, back in 1969, the song would end up with a parody in Futurama, Birds of a Feather. It shows up in weird places. It's an interesting legacy to be one of the most iconic one-hit wonders ever. Zager and Evans retain the honor of being the only number one artists in the US and UK to never have another charting record in either country. But the pair had real talent, as Denny Zager responded when asked about Rick Evans' death. Like any band, Rick and I had our squabbles, but there was a point in time that I felt we could have written some of the best music of the century. I miss him. And I believe him, on both accounts. For just as Rick Evans wrote, maybe somewhere else, it really is only yesterday. If man can truly survive, I'd like to thank my patrons, The Single Way Out, and the Jill Samini family. 